Good afternoon. You're watching Up to Data, a retail news chat show in which we discuss all things technology, digital transformation, and of course, data. Today, we have the founder of Gates Hospitality, Naeem Madad, joining us here in his restaurant. Thanks and welcome back to the show. Great. Thank you, Naeem, for joining us. Uh, first things first, how are you and how are your restaurants doing? I'm extremely well, thank you. Restaurants are doing very well, considering what's happening around the globe. Uh, we are extremely fortunate that the country has made some amazing decisions early in the piece and we are enjoying the benefits out of those and with the vaccination now escalating um, again we're seeing a lot of confidence in the marketplace so I'm all up for it and uh, we're not firefighting anymore we're planning we're looking for September from now we're looking for expo from now and we're making sure that all of our venues all of our events planners are taking place as we speak so it's exciting times Great. So since you mentioned vaccination, I have to ask you, uh, you did the entire uh, the scheme that was out uh, a few months back about, you know, the people who have been vaccinated, they get a discount, etc. And then you did receive a lot of backlash, which honestly for us, it didn't make sense because it's just something you are doing and you're supporting what the government is doing. Uh, ha has that sort of died down now? Look, within 36 hours, 48 hours, it was gone. It was done and dusted it. Um, but there was a lot of backlash for the wrong reasons. Again, all we did was we went to the market. We said, look, you know, WHO has approved this, right? Um, every single entity that is qualified has said, this is the right thing to do. Yeah. Our own government said, it's the right thing to do. So we thought, great, let's encourage that. Let's really uh, fuel that market and extend the discount at our cost. Yeah. And people came back and they said, Discrimination. I said, what discrimination? <laughs> uh, look, again, I think a lot of people don't like change. A lot of people don't want that um, spontaneous approach. And we, we're good at that. Yeah. We're good at that. We're always at the front. We, we, we're there uh, constantly. So um, I, I think it's all right. I think we had 123 international press releases. Mm -hmm. Chinese, Japanese, Greek. It was, it was incredible coverage. Yeah. Uh, but sadly, none of them in the country. So from a, from a revenue perspective, from a... Uh, economics perspective, uh -huh. it doesn't really make, didn't make any, any sense for the business, but from a positioning perspective, amazing success story. Right, amazing. So now that you've started mentioning numbers, let's talk about data, right? That's the, that's the whole purpose of the conversation today. Um, it's been called the new oil, it's been called the new soil, all kinds of terminologies around it. But for you, for an FNB outlet and for the FNB industry, how exactly is it that data or big data can play a role? Look, what, what has happened, I think, over the last 15 months as well, um, the whole pandemic has accelerated the way we analyze data, the way we access it, the way we look at it, and the way we, we seek it as well. Um, it's, it's never really been a discussion point in the F&B on how much data do you have, how much do you share, what do you do with the data as well, which is very critical and important. Yeah. Um, so what we always said is let's use third parties in order to make sure that our data is collected through the third parties, whether it's through offers, discounts, uh, membership and all of that. Nonetheless, um, middle of last year, we've made a conscious decision that we need to own that data. So we've established our own uh, app, Gates, Gates Way app. Mm -hmm. Three reasons. One is to make sure that there's no middleman um, building the data to, to sell the data rather than building the data to use the data well. So we, we've taken that on ourselves and all of a sudden now we have a, an open dialogue with our people. Mm -hmm. So all of our offers, all of our specials, events, activations, are available in that data. And we know your birthday, we know your special days, we reach out to you. So we've gone and said, what do we need out of this app? What is, what is it? The intent is to make sure that we, we, we promote specials, offers to, to the guests. Mm -hmm. We have a cashback uh, process as well. So people have that wallet. Uh, there's money in the wallet, let's spend it. Right. And we have gone a step further and we said, let's do it across all of our brands. So if you are at Reform today mm -hmm. and you spend money here and tomorrow you decide to go to Folly, mm -hmm. you can use that money there. So right. it's, from a consumer's perspective, it's very varied and wide. Right, so it's also like a loyalty reward system 100%. that's that's 100%. playing there. Right, so you've, you've spoken about how uh, you're using your data to reach out to your customers. Let's talk about it the other way around now. So in terms of the data that you've gathered from the customer, how is it that you leverage it in order to make these decisions when it comes to the specials or the menu changes or the pricing? 
So look, again, understanding the data is half of the battle. Because once you understand the data, if you understand your demographics, you understand the spending pattern, you understand the genders, the age group, all of a sudden you have a very powerful tool. You yeah. know what they're looking for. You know what they are, uh, what makes them tick. So it's not merely going through an Instagram account saying, oh, this picture is nice, let's go there. No, it's about, there's a lot behind it. Mechanics are very deep and meaningful. Um, it's not oil, it's not soil, it's human behavior. Yeah. It's understanding human behavior because again, we're all going through cycles of um, fashion. We're all going through cycles of habits. We're all going through uh, cycles of popul popular. What, what is modern, what is fashionable, what is... So if you understand all of these and then make sure that your brands are always aligned with all of them three, yeah. as well as have brand integrity. So you don't keep chopping and changing. You're reaching out to an audience that actually enjoys what you do already. They just yeah. want to hear about it. So understanding the data for me is the biggest challenge. Right. Uh, making sure that data becomes very valuable for us is us understanding it, us reviewing it, mm -hmm. and putting it to good use um, from, a, from a commercial perspective and from a service delivery exercise as well. Right. So from all the data you've gathered and you've tried to understand in the last year, what is it that you think that the customers want, your customers specifically want? The market has changed. Um, drastically, if I may add, demographics of, of the country have changed as well. So make no mistake about it. The biggest uh, interest is, and, and Dubai is very good at this, the discount kings and queens, we call them. People want those bargains, those values. So that's always a, a, a prime interest. People will stop and read if you have an offer of some sort. Yeah. But I think second and third is, is really in line with our DNA, brand DNA. It's, it's that engagement factor. People want to receive something specially for them. Mm -hmm. So if you receive something on your wedding anniversary, on your birthday, whatever it is, they feel connected. And I think it's very important for us. So engagement is one. And the, the, the second point that's equally as important for us is making sure they belong. Because again, when they come in, I keep saying to all of my guys, don't ask them, can I get you a drink? Still a sparkling water, the usual nonsense that we, we hear in, in our businesses. How are you? Did you find a park easy? Did you watch the cricket? Did you watch the football? Did you, how are the kids? Are they, are they playing uh, football tonight? Yeah. And can I get you a drink? So we, we're trying to have that belonging, but this is when you understand your data, when you understand the family setup, when you understand the, the behavior, mm -hmm. then you're not talking to a, a, a number, you're talking to a customer that is regular, yeah. that is wanting to be with you, and you want them to be with you as well. So it's a two-way street. It's interesting you mentioned that, right? Because obviously hospitality is all about the people, the staff, the relation and the connection that you build. But then today in the day and age of, of technology, which is sort of the conversation we are having, there is an element of human interaction minimalizing, especially when you go to uh, fast food chains, for example, <laughs> you know, it's everything is done on a screen. Like you, you click on the order, you place your order, everything happens through screens, through people, or through robots, through automated systems, etc. Uh, what is your personal take on that, about the role of technology being so intrusive today, even in the front end? Of uh, intrusive is a very good word. Um, I have a very strong opinion about this, and I keep saying to all of the IT um, service providers that you're a service support system. You're not ever going to replace an industry, be it service, be it hospitality, resort. So as long as we understand that there are support services to the business, the, the, the entire automation process, right? It's a support to facilitate, to make it more uh, seamless, I guess. Yeah. But it's never going to overtake. As a, as a matter of fact, in, in our industry, hospitality, we have a lady who does EI, emotional intelligence, mm -hmm. rather than artificial intelligence. So right. our business, as, as the word says, hospitality, right? So we need that engagement. We need that belonging. We need that conversation. Yeah. Uh, it can't be all automated. I, again, all of my venues, no one ever turns up to a table and takes an order on an on on automated pad. Right. It, we, we don't allow it. When you leave the table, you go to your station and you punch the order in mm -hmm. and then you get on with life. But I want you, when you're standing at the table, I want you to have that engagement. I want you to, to look at me rather than a screen. Yeah. <laughs> we do that every other minute right. on our phones. So um, it's a support service and I think it's very important. Uh, now, does that mean it doesn't help the business? Exactly not what I'm saying. It's very, very valuable for the business. But again, I think we need to learn where to use it, how to use it, mm -hmm. uh, and what to expect out of it. Because ultimately, it's a machine. Right. And the outcome is described by ourselves. Yeah. That's it. We all have that one person 
who needs not rhyme or reason. To make you smile, they always go the extra mile. Instant Smiles Gift Wrapped, just for you. Wear a smile. Find yours at RedTag. Great. Uh, so let's talk about where it's used then, right? What is the role that technology plays? Because you've been talking about the integration of technology in F&B, but you're saying you don't want it in the front end. So where do you use the technology and what kinds? Yeah, look, I want it in the front end, but I don't want it to overtake the human element. That's, that's my strong point about this whole thing. So we use it back of house, so all, all of our financial services, all our orderings, all our stock takes, yeah. all our um, temperature controls of the fridges, uh, our sign in, sign out. Any, any automated systems that could be applied and revised by the, the GMs of the venues, chefs of the venues, mm -hmm. great. This is where I want it. Uh, other cycle is a CRM, understanding what our customers' uh, needs, wants, behavior is like. Yeah. Uh, and last but not least, it's a commercial chapter of understanding spent per head, understanding peak hours, understanding length of time for the meals to come out of the kitchen. Mm -hmm. uh, and we, there's a learning for us. If a dish takes um, 40 minutes to come out every time, yeah. there's a problem. Yeah. So if you analyze this data and you put it to good use and you, uh, you find solutions, your business will benefit. Right. If you print out at the end of the month your best selling items and they're selling extremely well, there may be an increase of price of you know, one dirham or two dirhams. Mm -hmm. But because of the, the volume that you're generating, it's a massive outcome for the business. So yeah. like I keep saying, data is what you do with it. It's, uh, if it's just to generate reports and file them, mm -hmm. no one, nobody wins. Not the business, not the consumers. Yeah. Absolutely. So it's about driving engagement and revenue, right? The, the two needs to go hand in hand for a business to survive because at the end of the day, you are still a business. So at this point, what for you is driving engagement and what for you is driving revenue? Uh, engagement and revenue are not, cannot be separated. They shouldn't be separated. Mm -hmm. Engagement for me today, what I keep saying to my sales and marketing team, my PR ladies, uh, let's make sure innovation is always at the forefront of, of what we do. And we do that very well. So again, brand extensions, whether it's the boxes that we're doing folly by Nick and Scott, so you take these boxes home, everything's 80% prepared for you, 90%. So all you're doing at home is assembly. Yeah. But again, what we're doing is brand extension. And whilst you are at home, our logos are everywhere. Our brand is inside your house. So from a belonging, from an engagement perspective, we're there. And you, you're having a quality evening at home mm -hmm. based on the brand experience. Right. So we're controlling that technology aspect, even at home, because yeah. we have a QR code where you download it and you watch the, the video and you cook at home, you have quality, evenings at home by talented chefs. Right. Um, activations for me are extremely important. So, and again, obviously now with what's happening with the pandemic, you can do a lot of events and large, large scale uh, activities. Mm -hmm. But nonetheless, we're still doing bits and pieces in a smaller groups. Uh, we had the um, 12 chefs. Mm -hmm. So the best of Dubai chefs mm -hmm. came out um, on the 6th of December and again, February. So we had 12 chefs of Dubai, all of homegrown chefs uh, who have their own respective businesses and uh, 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 very famous chefs in, in their own rights. They had a station each outside and they all cooked one or two dishes. Okay. And what, what happened then is when you go to their restaurants, you don't actually see them because they're usually in the kitchen, could be on a day off, could be on a different shift. But in those, in those events, they were behind the station and you actually went up to them and yeah. you spoke to the person whose name is above the door. You mm -hmm. spoke to the chef who cooks, who cooks in that restaurant. Yeah. Uh, activations, innovations, and the last one is collaboration. So what mm -hmm. we have done a lot of is work with our colleagues in the industry. We're not competing, we're complementing. So we, we don't go to another pub and bring them to reform. We go to another cuisine yeah. that actually works with the business positioning. Mm -hmm. And we, we do work. We had, um, we had the team from 21 grams. Mm -hmm couple of weeks ago. No, there's an amazing story. We had Hatem Matar from Matar Farm yeah. coming out and did a massive barbecue outside. Everyone wins. Yeah. It's a new audience for us, new venue for the incoming brand um, and the guest is getting an experience. And this is where data become, becomes very handy because if you get them to sign on the app, all of a sudden you're talking to a new audience. Right. And that's my interest.
Great. So it's a collaboration against competition then uh, when it comes to 2021. And this is one trend we've seen across all verticals of retail. Uh, weirdly, competitors for decades have started collaborating now and that's great to see. You know, it's good. It's better for the customers as well. Like me as a customer, we love those collaborations because it's just better offerings, right? But going back to the first point you mentioned about, you know, for example, Folly by Nick and Scott when you have the takeout menus, uh, the different restaurants of different scales I've spoken do have such uh, varied opinions on this. For example, cloud kitchens, right? Let's start with that. So they think that um, restaurants, especially the mid to upper range restaurants, uh, it's all about experiences. So it's not really just about the food. So they've completely ruled out takeout and delivery and all of those options. And they think cloud kitchens is a separate business model for a different kind of setting. Um, so you've clearly gotten into the whole delivery side of things um, and you were probably pushed into it as well. Whoa, 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 be careful, okay. be careful, be careful, if I, if I may. Brand integrity for me is paramount. Mm -hmm. So again, we haven't gone to delivery. What we have gone is we said brand extension based on the brand. And the brand that, we're not sending you a meal to eat at home, we send you an experience mm -hmm. based on the brand. So when you get this box, it's, it's actually like a gift. So you open this box and there is itemized um, ingredients uh, there is a QR code, so someone's actually gone through a filming session to, to prepare this dish for you. Mm -hmm. uh, and there is step-by-step -step process. So yes, it's delivery, but it's, it's convenience at a quality, at a price point, mm -hmm. at an experience level. Right. So it's not, I, I have a ma major issue with dark kitchens um, processes at the minute. For mm -hmm. the simple reason is that not every business should be in that business. I yes. see those businesses as verticals that support the industry overall, right? So it's QSRs, fine dining, and whatever comes in between. Mm -hmm. uh, dark kitchens or, or ghost kitchens or whatever you may call them, great business. But I think, again, we shouldn't make the same mistake that we did five years ago or four years ago with the food trucks, mm -hmm. right? That was uh, an amazing idea at the time. Let's get food trucks. Everybody over-invested in food trucks. Yeah. We soon realized RTA doesn't talk to municipality. Municipality doesn't talk to car park owners. And the business model wasn't ready. Yeah. And then we also realized that in the States, in the, in the um, Western world, where these things work extremely well, it's an owner operator. So the chef drives and cooks. So it's not uh, an investor who hires someone to cook because he, he doesn't have that engagement factor. He doesn't have the know-how of how to, to engage. Right. Because these trucks are not about cooking. It's about cooking with passion, cooking with engagement factor. Mm -hmm. So going back to the, the ghost kitchen, as, as you rightly said, I think it's very important that we, as brand owners, have brand integrity. So out of my portfolio, mm -hmm. Ultra, for example, as a, as a brasserie, as a cafe, as a deli, if, if, we, if we may call it, there is a business model. So yeah. we do excessive amount of deliveries out of that kitchen. Uh, but Bistro does that, no delivery. Yeah. The experience is based on in-house services that we do. Yeah. And 50% of that happens to be the food and beverage. The rest is experience, the rest is service, uh, ambient settings uh, by the water side and so forth. Right, so it's all about brand integrity then, like the cloud kitchens do have a place, but for certain types of verticals and restaurants only, if I'm, if I'm getting it right. Great, uh, so just moving on to another thing that you mentioned with the, with the whole food trucks, right? Again, um, I, I wanted to bring it up in the conversation as well about the lessons we've learned from what went wrong with food trucks. Uh, right now, the only one that at least I see that is popular would be uh, Last Mile, is it? Last Exit? Yeah, which is still there, but then it's not really a food truck concept. It's just a, a concept a that's taken. Yeah, it's, it's a destination. Uh, so what went wrong? What are the lessons we've learned and how to make sure that doesn't happen again? Many things went wrong, but again, I think we shouldn't be jumping so quickly on copying ideas that work elsewhere in the world because our geographical locations, our <coughs> I beg your pardon, our um, demographics, our audience are different. And the lifestyle that we lead here is, is very unique to this part of the world. What works in Australia in, in a cafe shop doesn't work here. Mm -hmm. uh, again, the, the whole drinks of the, the bubble tea uh, drinks, right? In Australia, they're an amazing. Every second shop today is a bubble tea. Yeah. But 51% of our population is Chinese. So there's a direct connection that they need that. That's part of their part of their culture. Yeah. So our food trucks here, we don't have those business districts where people will come down for lunch. Mm. Those high-rise towers where thousands of people will come down for a quick 
healthy lunch, right? We don't have that. Yeah. We, we, we're 10 million people in the whole UAE, right? And if you take the workforce out, that's probably 60%, mm. right? They don't spend money in any of our businesses. Yeah. They send money home ultimately, right? Yeah. And then you have um, a particular amount of people who choose not to eat out, right? And then you have the rest, which is 20% of the population mm. that we're all fighting for. Yeah. <laughs> at all, across all positioning of, of yeah. the restaurants. So look, learnings are massive, but I think again, uh, brand integrity and also brand uh, due diligence. You need to understand what you're getting into. It's, it's a great idea elsewhere in the world, doesn't mean it's going to work in here. Right, and that's probably where data comes handy, right? Where you understand what the people want Absolutely. and what the country wants. Absolutely. Great. Uh, so another thing that we have to touch upon would be, um, you know, the entire relationship with real estate, you know, uh, restaurant, real estate. And I'm not going to get into... You, you're trying so hard to upset me this morning. <laughs> <laughs> Why? <laughs> No, so I'm not going to ask you about the whole landlord-tenant relationship because then that's just going to get ugly. Let's not, let's leave it for another day. But in terms of, uh, you know, where data could perhaps come into play is what kind of real estate works today? I, I know there's no blanket answer for it, but for your portfolios, for example. Uh, Great question. Uh, we're looking at a business in, uh, next to the new airport, uh, the South, Dubai South, mm -hmm. right? I'm trying to get some data on who resides in that neighborhood. Right? Right. It's nearly impossible to understand demographics, um, age group, uh, income pattern. And, and again, elsewhere in the world, I would walk into an official government office and I'd say, can we have some data on that? Yes, it'll cost you money, but it's, it's a transaction that you, you invest in because you all of a sudden are making an educated decision on your business model. Yeah. So here, what do I do? I have to hire two people that we educate mm -hmm. to drive around the neighborhood yeah. and see what cars are parked there. Not only one day, but you need to do it across seven days mm -hmm. to see the car profile. We go to the shopping centers and we see who's queuing and what's in those baskets. Mm -hmm. So we're having to do our own research, but this data should be readily available right. for us. And if it is available, I think the decisions that we make are a lot more informed mm -hmm. and a lot more accurate and will help us for three, five years business model. Right. So then that brings me to the source of data, right? Uh, F&B has relied on customers as source of data, as a main source. But when you're talking about a situation like this, you also need data from communities. You need data from governments. You need data from municipalities. How are we working in that side of things? Again, I think this is, uh, this is a massive chapter that needs to be undertaken. Um, and um, associations like Dubai Restaurants Group, uh, uh, one of our main endeavors now is to make sure that we start collecting this data through neighborhoods, whether mm -hmm. it's a JLT, whether it's a JAFSA. So they have the data, yeah. but we can't kind of put this data all in one uh, master document saying mm -hmm. and, and then share those, share those information. Um, historically, sharing information on the F&B front, let alone any other industry, has been very, very, very secretive. We don't share. Yeah. We, we try and hog all the information. We yeah. try to keep it to ourselves. Unlike in the hotel, I wear a hotel hat as well, we have reports like the SDR report where yeah. that is readily available. You know what your concept uh, is doing on an ADR. You know the red fire. You know their occupancy rate. And we should be doing exactly the same in order yeah. to make decisions based on factual information supported by the right demographics and their spending patterns mm -hmm. and neighborhood development. Because again, how many times has Dubai shifted in the last 10 years? Dubai's center, right? Where is the center? Yeah. Uh, so when, you, when you're signing up at least for five years, 10 years, you need to have these uh, information. Yeah, then we're also talking about regulations then, right? Because obviously everyone's not ready to give or you know donate their data, which they've earned. So there's also going to be an element of buying and selling data. But if you're talking about a collaborative environment, how would that work? So there probably is a need and a call for a regulatory authority to govern data, isn't there? Um, I'm, I'm, not in the, I'm not the right person to say yes or no, but um, Logic says yes, uh, and this data already exists because we all pay tax, municipality taxes. So they have our data from, yeah. a, from a performance perspective, from revenue perspective, that data exists. It right. just needs to be better used and better segmented mm -hmm. and put to a, a format where people can actually analyze it and say, outcome, outcome, outcome. Right. 
But going back to the whole real estate conversation we were having, right? Um, again, not talking about tenants <laughs> and landlord. I can see your face changing You're not every time I bring it up. <laughs> <laughs> I can see your face changing. But let me talk about, you know, where, uh, given the pandemic, given uh, social distancing, given tourism numbers, uh, which have been dropping, where do you think a restaurant can leverage more when we're talking about the mid-range at this point? Uh, is it a hotel? Is it a mall? Is it standalones? Is it within a community? Yeah, multiple answers. Mm -hmm. uh, we have, again, over the last uh, 10 years of, of Gates, my first five years, I would spend 50% of my time trying to find locations. Today, we get phone calls from agencies, brokers, landlords, um, desperate operators saying, I'm exiting, would you like my site? Mm -hmm. So the market has changed. So right. from, a, from an availability perspective, there's a lot more today on the marketplace. Um, as far as hotel, neighborhood, depends on the concept. And uh, fortunate for us, we're not selling one brand. We're not saying we have a uh, coffee shop. Let's, mm -hmm. let's have 20 coffee shops over. No, we, we look at venues. Yeah. We look at neighborhoods saying, who resides here? Again, my two guys who are driving around, writing data. Yeah. Who resides here? What do they have uh, from an income perspective? What do they have from availability in that neighborhood? Right. Who is the competition in that neighborhood? And then we plug a solution. So we, find the we've, we define the vacuum, we find a solution for it. Um, hotels work, the neighborhoods work, but, but again, I think moving forward depends on the brand. What is the brand that you're trying to position in those venues? Mm -hmm. If you put a, a reform in a, in a pub, in a, in a hotel, mm -hmm. may well work, but it depends who stays in that hotel. If yeah. it's a GCC market, for example, that don't, there's no relevance between positioning of a, of a reform and the GCC market. Yeah. Whereas if you put a, a bistro does that, being a success story. Right. <laughs> Great. Uh, so you've obviously spoken about the entire restaurant ecosystem and told us about how data can be leveraged. But we are in uh, uh, an over-competitive, over-saturated market, which is oversupplied with restaurants. I know a lot of overs here. But it's not just restaurants. It's, it's a lot of other industries that are going through the same problems, right? At this point, if there's a new restaurant that wants to come and add on to this ecosystem, what is the advice that you would like to give? How, how do you think they should go about setting up uh, an F&B retail outlet here in Dubai? Um. A lot of people look at our business from the outside and they think it's a glamorous business. Mm -hmm. People forget that uh, you don't just open the door and the food is ready, your mise en place is ready, your orders are done, everyone's trained. You don't open the door and it's ready. Basically what happens at 6 a.m. in the morning, the, the chefs are receiving orders, um, checking their the shopping lists, there's a lot of work. So for anyone entering the business, and I think the pandemic helped and I'll tell you why in a second. Uh, anyone entering the business now, they need to do their homework that this business is literally 24-7. It doesn't stop. So if the restaurant is closed, it doesn't mean that you couldn't be exposed to wasting money or yeah. losing money or mispositioning the brand. Mm -hmm. <coughs> uh, there is a massive also uh, challenge with recruitment in this part of the world. Um, and the last one is cost of conducting business. For yeah. it's, it's high. It's extremely expensive to conduct business in this part of the world. Um, so all of these chapters entering the business, like any business, whether it's retail, F&B, whatever it is, people need to be in the game. Or if they're not in the game, if they are investors, then put a company or an, or an individual who, who understands the business, who can do the due diligence, who can give you a report saying, if we did this, this should be the outcome over two or three years, uh, your return on investment is delivered within this amount of, uh, amount of years. The market has evolved rapidly. The market is, as you rightly said, before the pandemic, we were already oversaturated. Mm -hmm. yeah. Again, one of the highest per capita from F&B venues to consumers, right? Uh, which, again, I, I fully understand that the, the mindset. We're, we're developing a city, so we're putting the city on the map, and yeah. small businesses come and go in the, in the process. But as SME owners, we need to make sure that we protect our chapters, yeah. as well as brand the way, yeah. uh, along the way. Um, Pandemic, why did it help? Because it made a lot of people aware um, that the business is not an easy business. Yeah. And the business is not as glamorous as, as, as it looks. And anything impacts our business, whether it's positive, it's negative. We're always the first impacted and the last to get out of the mess. Yeah, oh wow. That's not a great place to be in, that's too bad. <laughs> it, it, it's reality. But, yeah. but again, for those who know the business, we, we've done extremely well. Yeah. Uh, we've, it's, it's navigating through the business and then your business objectives actually change. The purpose of the business doesn't change, 
but the objectives change. I keep saying to my guys, and I've never said that before, let's break even. I've never entered into a business to break even. I entered to commercially be a viable uh, business, right? But today we're breaking even because I'm looking at 12 months, 24 months. If you break even today and you survive these um, challenging times we're going through, you'll come out strong. Yeah. So one question is, is there still room for more players to enter or? There's always room, right? There's always room. And we will probably add three more this year ourselves. Now, mm -hmm. why? And Again, if you do the market analysis, if you do your research, if you have that access to data, and if you don't have access to it, you build your own data and, and see the marketplace. As consumers, we always want something new, but then new doesn't mean good. Yeah. Just because I go there once, it doesn't mean I'm going to go back. So it's the onus is on individuals or owners to make sure that the business delivers and hooks you in. So once you, you go, say, this is my new place. Right. Great. Thanks so much, Naeem, for joining us. Thank you for those valuable insights. You've given us a lot to think about. And thank you to all our viewers who've tuned in one more time. We will be back again next week with another episode of Up to Data. See you then.